Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Conversations in Black Studies. My name is Corey Walker. I'm the Wake Forest Professor of the Humanities and Director of the African American Studies Program at Wake Forest University. Conversations in Black Studies is a series of curated public conversations examining key issues and ideas in the discipline of African American studies. Conversations in Black Studies invites students, scholars, activists, and, and the broad community to engage some of the historic and contemporary questions and issues animating this dynamic and cutting edge field. It also enables us to develop new knowledge together grounded in the critical and comprehensive study of the peoples, cultures, ideas, and expressions of continental and diasporic Africans across space and time. Tonight, I'm glad to be joined by a dear friend and amazing scholar, uh, Sonia Ramsey. Sonia Ramsey attended Howard University where she received a Bachelor of Arts degree in journalism. She received her master's and PhD in United States history from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is currently Associate Professor of History and Women's and Gender Studies at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. She specializes in African-American gender history and uh, gender history, the history of education and Southern history. She is also director of the graduate certificate program in women's and gender studies at UNC Charlotte. An experienced oral historian, Dr. Ramsey was one of the original interviewers in the Behind the Veil Project, documenting the Jim Crow South, sponsored by Duke University and the Ford Foundation. Professor Ramsey is the author of several historical works, including Reading, Writing, and Segregation, A Century of Black Women Teachers in Nashville, that was published by the University of Illinois Press. She is author of The Destiny of Our Race Lies Largely in Their Hands, African-American women, women Teachers' Efforts During the Progressive Era in, in Memphis and Nashville, in the edited volume, Their Work in the Public Sphere, Tennessee's New Women in the New South During the Progressive Era, published by the University of Tennessee Press. She's also completing and finalizing uh, her forthcoming book that's scheduled to come out next year uh, in spring of 2022 on Bertha Maxwell Roddy. That book is entitled, uh, I probably have the older title. You do uh, have the older one. It's um, Bertha Maxwell Roddy, A Modern Day Race Woman in the yeah. Distance and the Power of Black Leadership. And that's coming to us from Florida, University of Florida Press. Press yes, in June. All right. So Sonia, thank you for uh, coming today. Thank you for stopping by and talking with us and particularly with our students at Wake Forest. And we're so excited to have you and, and so wonderful to see you uh, again and be right in the state of North Carolina with you again. Um, last time we were having fun over in Paris, so. I know that sounds grand, but yes. <laughs> now we're in North Carolina. <laughs> Well, let's begin because your because your background intersects with a number of the historical works that that you've published and are working on. Talk to us a bit about your intellectual journey, um, and that'll help enable us to walk into some of the work that you're doing, both in Black education as well as on Bertha Maxwell Roddy. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I think I'm unique rather than other um, scholars. I started my um, intellectual journey as a journalist. I was a journalism major. I wanted to have my own magazine, like Seventeen Magazine. Um, I, I found out it was more business than journalism, so I just didn't flounder for a minute, and then I ended up in history, which was always my love, but I was told by many, like many others have been told, that, what can you do with a history degree? So, But I realized that's what I love, and I ended up doing what but a great things with history degrees. So um, I did, and I was fortunate to be accepted into the graduate program at UNC Chapel Hill and I did history. And I had, was part of a program called the Behind the Veil Project where we traveled around interviewing people um, who remembered the era, of, who lived during the era of segregation. And it was um, eye-opening for me. And the um, subjects were chosen um, through community um, interested partners and things, but somehow I always ended up selecting teachers. I always ended up interviewing teachers. And I realized they had a story to tell and it was not being told. 
Um, they were integral to the part of the segregation, to the part of segregated education. But while we have covered what the um, students have thought about it, what the lawyers have thought about it, what the, um, the adversaries have thought about it, we didn't know what the teachers were thinking about it. So that became my kind of my, my uh, I guess, mission or my, my theme of what my research would be, looking at the work of African um, lives of African-American women educators. Um, because they intersect um, often um, as educators they had a hard time becoming principals or administrative tax so you had this kind of intersectional focus and so my first book after I graduated um, I worked in Texas University of Texas at Arlington um, was about teachers in Nashville so I do local history whereas and I think now the thing is the, the global diaspora which is so important but again to understand where you are first too but I do um, I did Nashville I grew up in Nashville Tennessee but while I grew up there, I didn't know those teachers' experiences. They were very different than my own. And so I learned a great deal. Even though I was at home, I learned so many new things, which is very interesting. Um, so I did that. I moved to North Carolina. I now teach at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. And I needed a new topic. And so I ended up going to a lecture named after the birth of Maxwell Riley lecture. And she's very familiar. Her name's very, very familiar. Now, um, my own personal note, I am a de member of Delta Sigma Theta, but I had not paid my dues in years. So I did not, I noticed her name is so familiar. And then I noticed all the Delta chapters, they stood up and said, oh my goodness, she's a president of Delta Sigma Theta. That's why I knew it. How embarrassing. Um, and then I realized that is what she doing here while she was Shirley. And I realized she started the Africana Studies program there. She started the National Council for Black Studies. We'll probably talk about that later. She started um, in founded the Gantt Center, and she was one, the, one of the first Black women principals of a white elementary school in Charlotte. And so my little history, history light bulb went off in my head. I said, that's my topic. So that's been a journey talking with her. So I learned, I've come to Africana Studies um, from a, a different perspective of coming as a historian. But and in my previous university didn't have an Africana Studies program. So I feel I've always done Africana Studies. I just had to learn the um, tenets of the field, the history of the field as a, as, as a field. And that's been an experience, an experience going to the National Council of Black Studies and um, talking with some of the um, uh, pioneers in that field and things. So it's very, bit, very exciting. Um, and so also I intersect in women's studies and gender studies and my work intersects in the field, very staid field of education, history of education. So I, I kind of transverse these very different fields. Um, and I like that. I like doing different things. Uh, and I don't, you don't have to just do one thing. That's one thing if you want to be in Africana studies, that's the whole core, but you get to do different things, right? So, and, and listen to different scholars conversations, which is exciting too. Um, so I think that's where I wanna, I don't wanna carry on too much, but I'll go as you get to the next one. Thank you. Now you you really talk, you, you make an interesting point that we know the stories of the children, we know the broader stories of the activists, we know the stories of those who wanted to continue uh, segregation. But the stories of teachers is something that's understudied and, and, and often overlooked. And your first book looked at the example in Nashville. Tell us more what you found in Nashville and talk to us a bit about what those teachers were doing uh, at that moment uh, of desegregation and what they were, how they were part of the freedom movement. Sure. And um, what well, going back during segregation, teachers were the key to um, ensuring that your, your child would have some type of success, some type of semblance of learning and literacy in a very segregated environment. The teachers were the ones who were charged with doing that. The community um, impl you know, imparted this duty upon them to do that. And they took a great responsibility in doing so. Um, the African-American schools that most went to, they had themes like by, you serve by precept and example. You serve by your reputation and by who you are. So this was an embodiment of who they were. It wasn't just a job that people had. So as we um, uh, society moves to desegregate, you have first you have um, psychologists from the Brown decision arguing that segregated schools were were just really um, psychologically damaging, which we see as a point. But those teachers in those schools were trying their best to make sure these students were not damaged. Um, so they felt a little bit like they had sacrificed a bit for desegregation in the beginning. Um, and um, and that you see as desegregation goes on, teachers lost. Um, Many teachers lost their jobs, many principals lost their jobs. So it was a loss, but they did gain. Um, they were able to go to new environments. 
Um, it was an ability because you would be in this new desegregated school, but you're the only black teacher there. You've lost your power. You've lost your camaraderie. You've lost your support system. So you had to create new ones. And then as a, te as a black teacher, and sometimes in Nashville, and I found in other studies as well, you took on new roles. Now you're a mediator, a racial mediator. Now you're a protector. Now you're trying to protect students from being falsely accused of things. So you're way outside of your teaching zone. But black teachers have always kind of gone outside of their zone just in new ways. So now their charge is not just to protect children under segregation, but to ensure that these children survive in a desegregated school and thrive in a desegregated school. And so that's their new mission. And so Max, Dr. Maxwell Roddy, I'll talk about in a minute, she comes from that tradition and she carries that tradition into um, an Africana Studies program. So as an educator activist, yeah. Great. I'm, I'm, I'm uh, reminded that uh, our colleague, uh, Derek Aldridge at the University of Virginia has launched the Teachers in the Movement yes, yes. project, which picks up and extends uh, this important work. So now we know those stories of and yeah. not only what teachers did in, in those segregated schools, but also uh, what they've done in the period of desegregation and yeah. what al also happened to their positions in those in deep institutions. But you spoke about Bertha Maxwell Roddy, and that let's let's transition uh, to her. Um, tell us a bit about her background and her upbringing. Right, Dr. Roddy is who I call her. You know, she would ask you to call her Bertha, but I have not yet been able to do so. But um, Dr. Bertha Maxwell Roddy grew up in Seneca, South Carolina. Irony, so did my mother. So I don't know what's happening with this. I feel it's a bit of fate, but she grew up, my mother grew up right outside of Seneca. So I knew that area very well. And it's a very small town in the Piedmont area, upper Piedmont area of South Carolina, about an hour and a half from Atlanta, um, that part of South Carolina near Greenville. And near Clemson University, if you know Clemson, um, they love Clemson. But she grew up um, raised by her grandmother and grandfather. Her mother had worked, um, had her without being married, and she moved to Charlotte. And so she grew up poor, very poor, but she grew up right on the outskirts of a wealthy um, land, a wealthy dentist, um, right outside of his um, land. And so she had this parallel world where she was really um, familiar with upper middle class and black middle class life but also had very limited funds. And so example would be her grandmother would get clothes from working for um, a lady, the lady's children and she would wear it. And all the kids would thought she had fabulous clothes, but that was because they were hand-me-downs from her grandmother's working as a maid. Within that environment, um, she grew up believing totally in herself and but also believing in her ability to succeed despite being poor. Also believing in her ability to learn from people who were poor, who were not poor or who published didn't matter who they were. And that's a trait she would carry on throughout her life and career of accepting wisdom from anyone, um, accepting leadership from anyone. They didn't have to have a PhD. They didn't have to do this, that. But if they could lead, they could lead. If they could work, they could work. And seeing that, um, not having those boundaries, not having that fear of others or intimidation by white people. Um, she worked for white people. Um, as one example, she worked for this lady and the lady wanted her to call her, let's see, she was maybe 12, I believe, and the lady wanted to call her six-year-old son, Master Billy. She said, I'm not calling him that. And um, she got away with it. She possessed, she grew up possessing this way of floating between all these different entities um, with charisma and style, standing up for things, but also um, Billy to bring people into her circle, to be able to not um, to cause animosity. Society now we're so in our silos and we don't talk to this group, we don't talk to that group. She talked to them and she talked to them, worked with them, and she was able to build bridges with them, which is they are a key trait to her success that we all would need to learn from. And it's just amazing to see it in person. You know, she is still living. She's um, had some health issues, but she would be right here telling you about herself as she could. Um, and so she's a little bit larger than life. It's sort of an awe to be around this kind of leadership ability. That's one thing doing a biography is interesting. Um, and then every time I would visit her every two weeks, to interview her. And every two weeks, she'd bring up something new that she did. So I was like, okay, we'll have to add that in. Uh, for example, I was talking about her childhood. She said, oh yes, when I was president of the chapter of the Southern Negro Youth Congress, I'm like, what? And so I had to go back and research that. So it's been very exciting. I, some people would think just learning about one person, oh, who cares? But she did so much institution building. She's touched so many different types of people's lives. So she was a person who would um, be um, with Karenga and um, James Stewart and the National Council of Black Studies and activists. 
And she also put on a sorority pin for the debutante ball. So she did all and, and didn't have any qualms about doing it. So that's another aspect of her. She bridges this idea of class divisions too. So I can go on, like I said, yeah. I'll let you go to the next oh. question. <laughs> You, you mentioned something uh, about her and uh, her youth and when she brought up that she was an activist with the Southern Negro Youth Congress. I mean, that that's huge mm -hmm. uh, to be part of that, particularly in South Carolina. I mean, that connects her with that broad stream of the freedom movement in South Carolina, also throughout the South, that what Charlie Cobb would call the organizing tradition. Yes. How does she move, how does she move in, in formally into education? Okay, so she um, was trying, wanted to go to college. It was her grandmother's dream. Um, she um, didn't have the money to go to college. So she migrated to Washington, D.C. to live with a relative and she worked as a wait waitress and she saved up. She ironically wanted to be a nurse um, and she applied to um, John Hopkins and she didn't really realize she, black people didn't go to John Hopkins and they accepted her, but she, she couldn't afford the tuition. If she had won, she might've been the first black person in the nursing program at John Hopkins. But um, she um, um, decided to come back to Charlotte, live with her mother and go to Johnson C. Smith University. And she majored in elementary education. Um, and so I think you know, that's another irony if you talk to your students that sometimes you make choices and they seem what you wanted wasn't what you thought you wanted, but it ended up being her life's work in education. And that's not what she originally wanted. That's what's interesting. Um, but she has naturally gifted for that field. So you never know where life turns you. So she, after she finished Johnson C. Smith, she, um, she starts teaching at Alexander Street um, uh, Elementary. And that, and that way she learns from these master black women principals that she had. Um, and they aren't talked about as much. They couldn't be principals of high schools. Women couldn't be principals of high schools during segregation, very seldom. But they could be at elementary schools. And she learned about from her mentor, Jane Hemphill, who taught her, she saw how she navigated with the white superintendents to get things for her students. She saw, saw how she navigated with the teachers um, and she learned everywhere she's gone, she observed and she learned um, and how to, how to be a principal. And she, they were authoritative principals. They had a ruler and they told you what to do and things. And she saw that she didn't necessarily want to do that, be that way, but she did see how they commanded. So she didn't have an intimidation about being later on being in the university because she had been seen leader women in leadership role throughout her career in some way. So um, then um, she becomes one of the first reading specialists. And this is the early mid-60s. Um, and in 1964, she saw that many people in her first world, children in her first world neighborhood had um, no access to kindergarten. You had to pay to go to kindergarten then. So she starts to get some, she, now this is the summer and you're academic, believe it or not, she gets her fellow teachers to work for free to do a summer enrichment program for, for, for kindergarten, a summer kindergarten program for the kids for free. They got no pay and they worked all summer and she was able to get them to do that. Um, she got um, found you know support from companies to pay. She took them on trips. She took them on an elevator. They had never been to an elevator. She just kind of blew their minds. And then the next year they come up with Head Start. So, and they patterned it after her program in Charlotte. So she's also a person of first. Um, and that's one thing we think about with, we talk about contribution history um, and that, like we need to go further than that, but there's still so many things we don't understand about the people who were first. And she was a first, she wasn't part of a movement. She was just the first, the first person to work at the bus station in the whites only section because they needed her. She was up under the counter handing drinks and their, um, the owner, the manager of the store said, listen, Bertha, listen, Bertha, just get out from under that counter. If you're going to be here, stand up. And then she said, I stand up now. I stood up. And so she was the first person to work in a receptionist in her dentist's office. And she was the first person to be in many, many, many things. And so they're, um, not, we're not too old to know that there's still many firsts still going around and they still need to be acknowledged, I think. So, and what do you do as a first? How, you, how do you do after your first? After you open the door, how do you keep it open? And so my entire book is about how she kept the door open in a lot of ways. Um, so, and she, um, should I go, let me, I'll continue a little bit. She becomes um, a principal, oh, she goes to graduate school and she didn't go to any graduate school. She goes to UNC graduate school. She's the first black person to get a um, master's in educational administration there. And a funny story there, she was just round walking around, going to the campus, and this white man would say hello to her. She said, hey, how are you doing? You know, she was ch chatting with him about things. He said, what about desegregation? She said, I hope we have it. You know, they're just talking. And then one person said, do you know that's the dean? 
that's the dean of the school? She said, no, I didn't know that. So he knew her. He got to know her. He got to be friends with her. Um, and so after she graduated, um, he wanted her to be a principal. She said, oh, no, I just did this because I don't want to be a principal. That's another theory with her. And I think women's leadership, too, is that they're reluctant leaders sometimes. Sometimes they really push through. But she she's never been one to be like, I want to do this. I want to do my ambition. She gets into these situations and she wants to make it work kind of thing. And so he really pushes her and the superintendent of schools get to know her. They're all friends, the dean and the superintendent of schools, and they all push her to be a principal. So she becomes principal of Morgan Elementary, a black, predominantly black school, and right in the time of desegregation and busing, and they decide to close their school. Because that's one aspect of desegregation we don't talk about was the closing of black school. And so she's like, okay, great. Well, you're not gonna take all my teachers and where she wanted to make sure our students went to the right school. And she talked to those principals and one principal was a little bit um, huffy and she went to the superintendent. So she said, you better get them straight, <laughs> get them straight. Um, and so she did, she ends up um, to close becoming the first woman principal of a new white elementary school and had four, three or four black students in the entire school of 300 and um, called Albemarle Elementary. They rode horses to school. She, um, if they didn't come, the parents were so shocked that she was a woman, A, eh, or shocked that she was black or both. And so she had one incident when a, um, a parent wanted to fire one of the black teachers. She fought to have her black teachers brought there too, so they didn't lose their jobs. And um, he was threatening her and she invited the school. He said, threatened to go to the school board. That's, she, invite, she invited the school board to a meeting at her school. So she said, gonna talk to him, talk to him while they're at the meeting. And he was so shocked that they all came to her school. And so she said, I'm not going to fire any teacher. So she challenged people. She would challenge you, but she also had allies. She knew how to build networks. Um, that's key. I learned with her um, being a, her successful reign is she was able to build networks. She didn't do it all alone, um, but she did stand out when she needed to. And so she, after Albemarle, she said it was like putting diapers on nets. Think about it. <laughs> Because of phrases. And I said, okay. And she leaves to go. She thought it would be an easy peasy place. UNC Charlotte, just, just teaching education, no breeze, no, no administrative work, no thing. And it just so happens it's the start of the Black Studies movement. And I'll leave that. I'll let you go to the next question there. So well, <laughs> well you 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 I want to back up a bit because you find the same thing in Charlotte that you found in Nashville. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. And, yes, and so these well. stories that at the moment of desegregation, you're seeing the closure of black schools. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the movement of black students to predominantly white institutions, but the, the principals and the teachers don't have a space there. How, was, how did Bertha negotiate that space to make sure that the teachers of her school that was being closed can come with her uh, to her new school uh, in Charlotte? And what did that mean for the way in which she thought about? Uh, that's a part of an activist uh, uh, role that she's playing uh, in that position. Well, one thing, she was active in the community. She was active in her sorority. She had been president of a sorority. She'd been president of other organizations. So, and from her experience in graduate school, she really knew the upper leadership of the school system. And so one of the things she negotiated was that, okay, they really pushed her to this job that she said, I'm going to do this, but I want these four teachers to come with me. Um, I want them to come with me. And also, she's very, very likable. She's very likable. And not, and not that it helps everyone, but she really is likable. And so it wasn't like they were just like, oh, we hate you, Bertha. It was like, okay, you know, it was a little bit of that. So she was able to do that, I think, because of her unique presence. Other people were not able to do that, and they did lose their jobs. Ironically, with the schools, they funneled money into Black schools right before they were really forced to desegregate. So some very new schools um, closed. And this was um, happened all over the South, the urban South especially. In the rural South, they merged schools and often closed. But usually Black schools were the ones that lost, they were closed. Uh, the culture disappears, the bands, all those kind of things go away. And she, she saw, and she would exercise this later in life, and one of the reasons she helped co-found the Gantt Center, which becomes the Gantt Center, um, was that she saw there's a loss in using these African-American cultural landmarks, these schools in this, um, this community. So she knew children were losing in this. So her mission now becomes to protect the black students, but also to um, show this new school that's predominantly white that she is a teacher principal, just like anybody else would be their principal. And she will be a good principal to show that to them as well. So she had a two-sided two thing there. But 
that was the case um, with her being able to keep her, most principals could not keep, um, some of them lost their jobs. And so she thought she was gonna lose her job and they pushed her to do this, um, to do this. Some of the older black principals did lose their jobs in certain ways. So. Well, you, you talk about uh, Bertha Maxwell Roddy moving to the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, but this is also the time where there's really some uh, action going on in North Carolina. We got the Allen Building takeover at Duke. Uh, we have the protests going on in, in Greensboro, particularly 68 to 70. And of course we get the, the riot in, in 70 in Greensboro. We get a riot in Winston-Salem in 1967, and there's all this activism. You got Ben Chavis down there at Charlotte. Mm -hmm. Talk to us a bit about the school. She's entering the University of North Carolina, Charlotte, but there's all this other stuff going on outside of UNC Charlotte that will eventually impinge on her direction. Sure. Well, first, a little bit about UNC Charlotte. This is a unique school. Um, it was started in 1949 as a... Um, a night school for returning veterans. And they hired this woman, Bonnie Cohn, to teach there. Um, being short, eventually she runs the school. Eventually she, um, and her kind of ability, she's also a unique leader. Um, she, she pushes the school to grow into UNC Charlotte, eventually becomes a um, four-year college, except into the UNC system as a university by 1965. So this really, it had been a community college. Um, it had one time had a segregated version called Carver College. And there was a lawsuit to merge them. It was a successful. But here we get to 1965, and it's a new school. And it's a desegregated school on, on the books. On the books, it is. On the paper, it's a desegregated. They had um, one Black faculty would come a year later. Um, but that's it. And a few stu Black students. Nothing said on paper that you could not go there. But it just, they had no, so I'll just say they had no students, no faculty. So she comes there. It's unique. She's the second Black faculty at the school. And she comes in the College of Education, which was the College of Human Development at the time. So while all of these things were going on, she was more engrossed in the school, public school desegregation saga, not the higher education. Um, but soon as they get there, here she starts being asked to be on many, many committees. And one was the Black Studies Committee. And she's like, okay, I don't know what that is, but okay. And as her joke, I didn't know what it was, but they searched for many male all over the country for directors. And, and since it was a new school, it really kind of a commuter school, it wasn't UNC Chapel Hill, right? It was a little separate, little smaller version. And some of our premier Black scholars were like, I don't know, I don't want to teach there. So they had a hard time finding someone and so they look around and look around and look around and hey she's sitting right there in college in the college of human development teaching um people about desegregation so they said well do you want to do it and she said um at first i'm gonna have to talk to these students so right before then unc charlotte's black students had done a takeover of the school in um, 1969 in commemoration, commemoration of the Arnsberg massacre in the south um one of the things that spurred black studies was um, the Orangeburg massacre was horrific, and that really pushed students to really want to make a change. And they lowered the black flag and do this. So they they were activists, and one of them was Benjamin Chavis, right? So he was there, TJ Reddy, and other students, a lot of other students too, not just those two. So here they are, they're they're black student activists, and here she is in her nice teacher outfit and everything. And they're like, they they she says they thought I was a handkerchief head. And I think, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'll just say they thought she was just going to be like, okay, because there's a there's some blacks who were very wary of black studies at the time, older blacks and in some work. So, um, and but she's like, listen here, and she had learned how to curse from her neighborhood. She just learned how to curse, and they were cursing, and she cursing right back. And um, she's like, I, you can say this, but I have the schools to run this program. So blah blah blah. And they decide to hire her. She wanted to get their approval first. Um, and so she joins the she joins the founding director of the Black Studies program. So now she's like she's like how do I, I didn't, what is Black Studies? I have to figure that out. So she contacts Vincent Hardy, and Institute for the Black World in Atlanta, and studies with him. Um, but even before she brought some students down there, and it's a funny story. He's like, well, I'm going to have to charge you $6,000. She's like, you're not going to charge me any $6,000. These students need this Black Studies. You better teach them Black Studies. And um, and I'm not even imitating her the best way she did. But um, he was like, okay. And they ended up being friends. But she studied under him. She studied under a lot of other scholars. So one thing, if you take over a program, you can't just like, yeah, yeah. She had to learn what Black Studies was. 
And so she did, and she had to develop a curriculum. And because of the students there, she saw there were so few black students. Her mission becomes um, developing a curriculum that wasn't just academic. It had to be academically rigorous, but it also had to deal with creating a sense of a culture of belonging for these students. And that's a new phrase I just learned from um, Stephanie Holmes Pickett, a desegregation, I mean, not desegregation, a, um, diversity inclusion uh, expert I just learned over the weekend, but Dr. Roddy was doing it back then. She wanted to create a culture where black students felt the school was their own, where they belonged, where they didn't feel isolated. And um, you know, if something happened to them, they had somewhere to go. And so that was a part of a bigger part of her curriculum. And so she had a curriculum that was built on to get it right. Awareness, awareness of where you are. Let's see, I get this spelled, um, get this right, uh, awareness catharsis, um, the removal of barriers prevents ideas and feelings from being brought to the level of reflection, Black functioning, applying their knowledge to working in the community, and liberation. And a part of that first year, you would go through, um, why, um, who am I? Who are you as a Black person? And then next second year, why am I here? The third year, where did I come from? And a phase four would be, where do I go from here? So that's the broader idea of um, the curriculum, but within that you take traditional courses like English and history and political science, but you also had encounter groups where they learned how to get in touch with their feelings at black people. You um, had counseling, teachers had, we don't do that now, teachers served as counseling and they had to. Um, you had um, internships where they did internships in the community, you had to work in the community. She thought one of the fundamental core aspects of black studies was um, taking this knowledge outside of the Ivy League walls or the, into the community and helping the community with what you've learned. Um, another aspect was, you know, people always say, what are you going to do with a job in Black Studies? What are you going to do with a job? And how are you going to work there? She made sure they worked um, in their major. They worked alongside any honors thesis. They had some written documented proof of what they've learned. They could take to employers and say, bam, this is what I've learned in Black Studies. So she believed in the practical and the aspirational um, she had to go through many navigational pitfalls with administration. Um, she did so. Um, one of the recent courses she wanted to teach was called the Black Aesthetics. And the dean was like, well, is there such a thing? I don't know. And she had to educate him and persuade him that there was such a thing as a Black aesthetic. Um, so one of the core things she had to do in general with this was a constant educating people about what Black studies was and it was important. And this is a time when people didn't know Black people had history, some people. They didn't know, they really didn't know there was such enough things to have Black studies, believe it or not. So she had to do things. And at the same time with being a new university, as the university grew, Black studies grew. So she asked for more library books. She asked for more faculty outside of what your traditional academic. She asked for more student services. Um, she asked for students to be included in this group and in that group. So she was also that kind of advocate. Some of her students remember her walking across the campus and they knew she was going to tell another person, professor off or do something, you know, she was on the warpath. Um, but she also just got to be great friends with other um, professors too. She didn't have all support, of course, but she had one or two allies. And one ally she had was unique. She had a benefactor named um, Alice Tate, the great granddaughter of a um, textile magnet. So this woman was unique where she was a kind of an opera singer that never quite made it, but she fell in love with black studies and she became great friends with Dr. Roddy. She wanted to visit Dr. Roddy's house. Dr. Roddy let her visit and stayed at her house. I mean, she even, so she gave about $250,000 to the UNC Charlotte for the black studies program. With that support, which was a lot of money in 1970s, 68, 70s. Um, yes, it was a lot of money. Um, they, what could they do? Could they do anything to Black Studies? No. So she had protection. She knew how to get protection. Um, and so she, uh, the Dr. Ms. Tate also started the um, Jewish study, religious studies program in certain ways, many Jewish parts of it. Um, and so she, um, well, a Jewish studies part of religious studies to be accurate. But she was eccentric and nice with Dr. Roddy um, really just let her, but one thing with her being a benefactor, she had no say over the influence of the program. She believed in get help, but you didn't control the program. She didn't have that aspect. So she didn't have to worry about foundation support and the program, that kind of issues and things. Um, it was a Southern community school. Foundations weren't gonna give her program support in way that much. So she had to get it from different places. Um, and so she has Alec Tate. And then um, a lady who used to work, um, she grew up in the kind of mountains of North Carolina. 
She uh, is a white lady who grew up in Georgia, but teaches at Morehouse. She comes to UNC Charlotte and she becomes a more than an ally, a co-conspirator with Dr. Roddy. Um, and uh, her name, Ann, her name's Ann Carver. And Ann Carver was such a dedicated person that um, they decided to do a program where they went to go get um, students from well, men from the workhouse um, that had been released from prison, they still were on parole, were kind of in between. And she take them, they take them to UNC Charlotte and put them in classes. And they just forgot, in quotes, ask the administration about it. And um, so that that didn't that worked out interesting. When that found out, the administrators were like, oh my God, we could be liable, all kind of thing. She said, and that one of her phrases is to better to ask for ask for forgiveness and ask for permission so she just went on she said and one of her quotes is um if sometimes if you do black studies you might have to go to jail and she went to go to jail to get the prisoners or go to jail if you got in trouble so so she she kind of wanted to you know she kind of did what she wanted on campus and wanted to see what happened she was really bold in that aspect um in certain ways um and her students were just loved her and her office they called it you know it was called a home away from home she had you could watch soap operas there um, you could take type your papers there. Um, now, some of the other professors are like, what in the world are these students doing? But she wanted to create a little bit of an oasis for them because um, she wanted them to really embrace the school as their school. And they do. They love their school. Um, not to feel like, oh, that's somewhere I just went that I didn't really ever belong. They belong there. And she was key to doing that. When she first, when this freshman, black freshman first got there, she and Dr. Herman Thomas and Dr. Carver would go there to meet the freshmen and say, you need to take this block course. You need to be in Africana studies so you can have a cohort of people. And out of that, going to meet the freshmen during orientation, eventually you have orientation services emerge on campus. Um, she, um, with her internship programs, you have service learning eventually emerges on campus. So several of the key um, foundational organization pro programs that she created become lasting institutions at the university and all over universities. Um, multicultural services, student orientations, um, things like that. She believed and started those kind of programs. They had not been there before. Um, and so she's key, um, I say, to really giving you the prep the, the heart of a desegregated university beyond having five black students, 10 black students. What does it mean to go to that school if you're um, a minority? And she made, she made those students feel like that, but they were part of this university. And so that's, that's one of her lasting legacies, I think. So that's. You talk about her role, her instrumental role in building uh, and as an institution builder at UNC Charlotte, uh, that Black studies is not only uh, the intellectual arm of the Black freedom movement, it also provides a way for students to transition and take ownership of the university that it is theirs. It's not only that, it also extends to the community and you have this activist element coming through again uh, with uh, Dr. Roddy, moving through this particular way of thinking through not only how do we relate to the broader campus, but how do we get those who are peripheral or marginalized in the community to the campus? But there seems to be, she, she's always building and yet she's building more. Yes. Uh, talk yeah. to us about Bertha Maxwell Roddy and the birth of the National Council of Black Studies. Yes, yes. Um, so it's a, all around at the same time. So I'll just come back to the GAN Center a little bit later. But so she is struggling to get her um, program to be a major. And within academics, that's one thing you want to do to get your program a major, to get your program to be a department. And um, she was getting a lot of administrative barriers to do this, and she needed support. She was maneuvering through it and eventually she succeeded, but she saw that this would be a problem for other Black Studies programs across the country. They're being attacked. They're unconventional. Although administrators are not known for their liberal, wacky, you know, philosophies, they're very, very rural, rural adherence there. And so she, she had to get some things. And also in the um, universities, you have to be accredited. And she wanted people who could accredit her program that knew what they knew what it was. <laughs> you know, so she had been doing accreditation as a teacher and you know, principal prior to that. So she knew that administrative background. So she calls for a conference in 1975. Um, to talk about Black studies. And a lot of the leading practitioners of Black studies were there. And out of that, um, many, most of them were male, young students, and there she was. And so they're like, what's this lady? You know, they got used to her and her program. Um, and she, the program, she says, we want to have an association. And out of that, working together, they formed the National Association, uh, National Council for Black Studies. And with that, um, with the early founder, she takes a different role where she just wants the organization to succeed. And another kind of gender thing is she let these um, 
very strong masculine type figures, um, Melissa Karenga and then Leonard Jeffries and all these type of people, they, they let them take the lead as long as she got the stuff done, as long as they got the stuff done. If they got to have the conference in their city, she let them be director of this. So she was navigating things, so, uh, you know, letting them have certain areas and they, you know, they, so over time, people didn't really actually acknowledge her, but she was the founder of the organization. And they, you talk to them in person, they're like, oh, yes, she was, but it wasn't, you had to really push for the knowledge that she was the founder. Um, and one of her goals was to um, build a community of um, studies practitioners to support each other. So what she learned from them is she learned the theory. And one, one funny story, um, there was a debate about Pan-Africanism and cultural nationalism. They were going toe to toe. Those guys were fighting it out. And she stood up on the table and said, shut up, we have work to do. And they're like, yes, Sister Bertha. And they sat down because she had, they had practical things they did to do. So where they were developing these great theories that become the theoretical philosophies of black studies that we've all learned and love, um, she was giving them the practical administrative experience of how to keep um, advice on how to keep their program and how to make it survive so it wouldn't be shut down. And so they really work together with that. Um, and so she works with the National Council for Black Studies. Um, she uses it in many ways. In UNC Chapel Hill in the um, in late 80s, there was a woman named Sonia Stone was a great Black Studies director and she was really being challenged for tenure. And so Dr. Roddy got the National Council for Black Studies. It had maybe five, you know, a few members and put it on this nice letterhead. It's like, we demand that she be have a fair tenure you know, you know, be fairly promoted for tenure. We demand that. And they that really stood there, but nobody knew it wasn't that many people in the organization yet. But she used that as a, a tool to help people. She wanted the Black National Council of Black Studies to really be a resource to help um, Black Studies programs thrive and survive, because some of them are really being challenged at this time. And so she does that institution. Um, eventually, it's the premier um, Black Studies institution that we have today in some ways. Um, another year before, um, she wants to help one of her colleagues, um, her faculty, Mary Harper, um, get, get her dissertation approved. Uh, through and she wanted to do a part of her dissertation was working creating this black little Afro-American cultural center in Charlotte. Dr. Roddy signs co decides to help her found it. Dr. Roddy ends up taking the organization and building it using her community connection to have a, a board member of people asking Harvey Gantt joins in the committee becomes mayor of Charlotte. Eventually, um, the, the Afro-American Cultural Center, um, they become um, one of the leading arts institutions in the city. Now, one of the reasons they wanted to do that was because Max, Dr. Harper and Dr. Roddy saw that so many of the Black institutions were shut down. You have the Black schools being shut down, and one in Charlotte and other cities, you have urban renewal, which is really Black renewal, decimating, erasing Black neighborhoods. They're gone. And so she saw these children seeing no cultural landmarks, seeing no cultural school entities, and she wanted to create a center where they could learn about their culture. Um, so over the years, the Afro-American Culture Center morphed into this fabulous kind of museum thing. Dr. Roddy Lewis would be ambivalent about that, but, um, and, but she sees the progression, but she's joining boards across the city to get more power. So you see the breadth of Black studies being pushed in on all these different ways as she advocates for Black people in certain ways. And so I see a merger of civil rights and Black studies kind of in this desegregated area where you're trying to enter these doorways and keep them open, right? You're keeping open, trying to get more opportunities for Black students, for Black people. So, yeah. This is an intensely local story about Charlotte and really how Dr. Maxwell Roddy moves through Charlotte, both the public schools and UNC Charlotte, um, both through education, um, primary uh, education, and as well as university education uh, through Black studies, but it's also a national uh, story. I mean, her story really connects her to some of the broad trends in Black studies, from Vincent Hardy and the Institute of the Black World, to bringing people like Ewart Guineer when he was director of Black studies at Harvard down to Charlotte and creating uh, the National Council of Black Studies, to then move branching out, using the civic space to create the, an art institution, the Gantt Center. Uh, I'm thinking of the Deltas, uh, the Delta Sigma, Deltas oh, here. That's another Winston, story, yes. <laughs> uh, created the Delta Art Center uh, here in Winston. These in independent Black institutions that are being built, uh, that are being supported in and through the work uh, through Black studies, but yet 
she's also making inroads uh, through through her sorority. I think yeah, I didn't did know. It was, that's true. Yeah, we, very much so. All of this uh, president of Delta Sigma Theta. He does. He does. Talk to us about a, talk to us a bit about her work and in, in that civic space and that that aspect of her institution building work. Yeah, so around the late 60s, in 64, she becomes president of the Delta chapter and local Delta chapter. And she was out playing cards and they evicted her chairperson and she was so shocked um, she was president. But there she takes that and brings in, um, helps educate people about the war on poverty. She helps make the um, uh, chapter financially sound by working with another store, Grace Solomon, to create a debutante ball. And most people are like, whoa, but she used that debutante ball in a unique way. She went to the newspaper editor of the Charlotte, um, the Charlotte Observer and asked, why don't you put Black people in the um, society, in the publication praise of events? Why aren't we in events like brides and pageants and things like that? Why aren't we there? And she kept asking, why aren't you there? So they got them there. So she's getting more space for Black women, for Black people to be in um, the media. And so they raise money with the debutante ball and she go, and then she'll go right to an NCBS convention at the same time. She had no problem. She takes black studies into, into Delta. So she takes African philosophy of um, Ubuntu and takes it, I am, we are, and this is our Delta speeches. She does leadership workshops that she did um, for the black studies for um, the black studies, African-American black studies associations and things to Delta and leaves them there. So she blends all these together. She doesn't see a dividing line between this thing. This is the black middle class. These are the activists. They are both. She is both. And so um, if they didn't do what she wanted, she pushed them to do what they wanted. Um, so she brings organization and administration to some of the um, some of the roles she's in. Um, she ne didn't necessarily want to be in some of the positions, but she uh, did so um, because she didn't like something that was happening in the sorority and she wanted to change it in certain ways. Um, she did a um, lot of work on trying to mitigate or diminish um, issues of hazing and different things in the sorority. When she is elected president um, prior, she's the first black woman elected, um, for, not first black woman, the first black person from her region elected to the presidency. And they're very happy about that. So she is an entourage kind of how Bertha's girls who help support her and campaign. It's very political like any other political campaign, which I was found fascinating. So I'm in the sorority, but I didn't know all of this stuff. So I'm just really learning all this, get the, get the election things. So she rises to the top of the election. Um, and she's an outsider. She's not, um, she's an outsider or insider like um, Ella Baker was in the civil rights movement. She's in it, but not really in. So the East Coast with the Howard and the, you know, or the Southern with Spelman, they're, they're the big powerful regions in the sorority. And she, um, she was in a smaller new region, but she had a devoted following and she made network and meet people um, and things. So she was able to be elected. And when you're elected, um, Delta Sigma Theta is a public service authority for people that don't know. It's, um, it had about 200,000 members at the time. And you have a platform. We have a platform and a platform, which is really how many black women get a platform to do things like that. And all those people have to do what you say. And so she has this platform and she says she wants to um, um, this is 1992, build houses for Habitat for Humanity. And because she saw that black women, single black women um, were main ones that needed housing and being taken advantage of some of these, now we know predatory loan things, but she wanted them to do that. So she got the Deltas and the, and the, and the Gala. She said, guess what we're gonna do, build houses. And some of them are like, what, you know, what? And she said, yes, you are. So they got their, ha got their hammers and they started building these houses. So, and they were happy to do that over, by since 2007, they built over maybe 300 houses in certain ways, that's a lot of homes. For people. Um, they build houses in the United States and in Ghana, so in certain ways. Um, so I think that she um, kind of shook Delta up a little bit. She wasn't, the, you know, but she shook them up in the best way to help push them forward by infusing Black studies into, into Delta without maybe they didn't know it per se, but they were doing that. Or, or they're already doing the same thing. They're already doing this activist work that really isn't the separation. So um, that's one thing to look at her life. She's not about separations. Um, she would go um, talk to, um, you know, Leonard Jeffries, and then she'd go talk to the one of the most um, prestigious sorority lady you ever see. You know, she just had been friends with all of them. So, and do that. And because she was just herself, she's just herself um, and still herself. So she, she retires from UNC Charlotte in 1986 and continues on 20 years teaching at the University of South Carolina at Lancaster. Um, so she has a whole nother life there. She starts community um, 
um, works with the museum helping to reunite the, um, not a museum, it's a plantation and helping the people to reunite the black residents together there. She's still building institutions late until recent, until recent years in some ways. Well, from the Southern Negro Youth Congress to her work in public education to black studies that not only moves in the university, but also in the art world, uh, as well as in uh, the civic and the fraternal and sorority world with Delta Sigma Theta. There is something that draws and animates uh, Bertha Maxwell Rodding. You, you named this a womanist ethic of care. Talk about that concept and how it really captures uh, the actions and thinking and philosophy of Bertha Maxwell Roddy. So if we think of womanism as, as um, kind of an intersectional focus where women are concerned not just for their own equality, but for the uplift and safety of their communities, which includes men, includes everybody, uh, as womanist, um, she carries that idea with her in her career. So she is supporting students. She's supporting um, dominated male-dominated National Council of Black Studies. She's blending, um, pushing forward for women. She has one of the first Black women's history courses in Charlotte. She's also advocating for prisoners as well as male prisoners. She's advocating for all of these entities as, as a part of her whole um, mission and purpose in life in life and in her career. And so I didn't mention she ran for the North Carolina Assembly. That's another interesting experience. And she worked with Jesse Jackson and everything. So she dabbled in real high level political office, but she you know, made strides, but she could only do so. And she won, she got a democratic primary. She didn't win the actual election, but she did so as a black studies practitioner. And so it shows how black, she's bringing black studies into the mainstream but she's bringing it as it is. She's not sanitizing it. She's not having it die down. It's as it is, um, which um, you could do, but which we see, um, I don't know if we know enough about the legacies of black studies in a lot of ways, but she's one of the people who carry on these legacies um, as a womanist in her ethics of care. And I also call her a modern day race woman because she, I mean, because people were dating, she is, that was, is she an activist? Did she march? But she's after the marches. She's, she's doing things after the people marched, after they kind of sat down. She's carrying this on. And so she may not have been, you know, setting fire to, you know, burning a building or whatever you do, but she was um, an activist. She was a modern day race woman where every aspect of her life was to uplift the race. Sonia, with this this work on Bertha Maxwell Roddy that comes out next year, you're going to do a great service uh, to the Queen Mother. National Council of Black <laughs> Studies uh, gave her the Queen Mother title in Thank 1992. Um, what do you see as the future uh, of not only her memory, but how she, the, the memory of her work, but the future of the field in light of this work? What do you see coming up uh, for Black Studies? I would hope it helps us to, this my work and other work, help us to release some of our balls and barriers we have on who's an activist, who isn't an activist, who belongs in Black Studies, who doesn't, what is Black Studies, Black Studies can be everything. Um, I want us to learn more about the legacy and the breadth of Black Studies in different areas and acknowledge that and uplift that. I think we need to work um, with becoming Black Studies, becoming the thought leaders of, of activism again, um, as we have all these um, continuing forces telling you what to teach and um, governmental forces, Black Studies, we need it now more than ever to support our teachers, the K through 12, to support our community leaders. Um, we need to you know, tell, help share the truth and bear, be bearers of the truth again. Um, I also think Black Studies needs to um, expand its social media presence and um, expand our scholars are still a little bit in silos. We're doing this great knowledge and your everyday people need to know more about this knowledge She's and following her footsteps of bringing it to the community um, and maybe not build institutions if we can't, but also go on YouTube or somebody like, how we need to get this knowledge outside of our traditional academic things. It's still be an academic, but also acknowledge service is important and whatever service you can do is important. So I think those are some of the future things that vying from her. Um, and one of the things that's not hold judging people by who what they look like, oh, you're in this sorority, are you in that club? Are you an activist? And what can you do to serve? What can you do to serve? I think that's how she was. Well, I know you're a proud Howard alum and uh, just bringing it to the community, of course, um, thinking when you just said use YouTube, uh, one of the most popular uh, channels uh, and programs on YouTube is 
uh, program that features Professor Greg Carr, the chair oh, yeah. of Africana <laughs> Studies at Howard. Mm -hmm. Uh, and Greg is just a longtime stalwart in Black studies and also uh, a key institution builder. So uh, there are those who are heeding those words and going forward. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you, Sonia. It's so great to see you again. It's so great to connect with you. The book comes out in June of 2022. Yes. And you can email me and I'll give you a discounted flyer to pre-order. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll definitely take a bunch of those flyers and we're going to right here, we're going to make the promise. We want you on campus to do the book talk uh, oh, here in, at Wake Forest uh, okay. in the fall next year. Thank so we're, we're going to make that happen. Um, Thank you. Hopefully Thank you. pandemic, you know, we will be in a different place in the pandemic, yes. uh, but we definitely want to have you uh, with us and talk about that book and also sell some more copies. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for your help and congratulations on your programs. Wonderful. Well, we're we're trying to build here at Wake Forest and we're gonna have a summer institute for uh, public school teachers and uh, community organizers uh, next summer. It'll be our first uh, institute. Okay. Uh, we, we've provisionally titled it, bringing it from uh, Fisk and the title uh, of, the institution, of the institution at Fisk, People's College. So yes, wonderful. Everybody would love that. She would love that, yes, yes. So Sonia, I want to thank you so much for joining us and thank everyone for joining us for this wonderful program. And it was so uh, influential and so uh, educational. Uh, thanks, Sonia. And next week, uh, join us again, seven o'clock, Conversations in Black Studies, when we'll welcome our colleague from Howard University, uh, Joshua Myers. Wow, okay, great, thank you. Bringing Joshua <laughs> next week. Uh, let's thank Sonia once again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and we wish everyone a good evening. Thank you. Thanks.